Hey guys, welcome to another video, and today we're going to be looking at the book that I am very late to. <laughs> Initial reactions, absolutely loved it. We're talking about um, Step Closer. I am telling you right now that this story gives us evidence, like massive, massive, like basically confirmation on who Michael Afton is. The puppet carver has been released now and all three stories are pretty good. But this one, this one gave me a huge reaction. The first uh, Tales from the Peter Plex book has been leaked and I'm not gonna spoil it, but if you wanted lore in these books, that is exactly what you're going to get. Recently, the story GGY from Tales from the Peter Plex number five was released and this story is absolutely wild. I just read through the nearly released Tiger Rock Tales and I have a lot to say. First thing is, this book is a wild roller coaster of emotions. I was in shock, then I was laughing hysterically, then I was screaming. And that was just one story. You're safe here, Rory. This is your home. You've been watched over here. You've never been abandoned. Never left alone. All these years you've been cared for. Because you're special, Rory. And you deserve to live in a special place. Safe and secure. Never alone. Tales from the Pizzaplex, FNAF's second anthology book series, is about to come to a close. A whole eight books that tell stories with various different themes. Deception, disguise, and illusion. Think about Cade in Lally's game, Martin in Sub Mechanophobia, the Victoria robot in Help Wanted, and the Gen 2 Bobby Dots in the Bobby Dots Conclusion. Grief, agony, and deterioration. Look at Jessica in Frailty, Billy in B7, Sam in Somnophobia, and Edwin in The Mimic. Technology, isolation, and surrealism, shown off by Maya in Under Construction, Robbie in Animatronic Apocalypse, Kai in Tiger Rock, and Kara in Drowning. There is something for everybody in these books. Some of the stories are terrifying, some existential, and some that make a grown man cry. And as we approach the end of these books, I worried what they had saved for last. And man, they did not disappoint. Today we are talking about the final story of Tales from the Pizzaplex, Dittophobia. Now I'm aware that this book isn't even out yet, so this is your big spoiler warning for this video. We have a lot of things to talk about, and surprisingly the mimic isn't one of those things. Meet Rory, a kid who lives in... wait, what's this? The freaking FNAF 4 house? Quote from the book. Nothing looked out of place, his blue-grey furniture, a tall chest of drawers, which held a purple fan and the lava lamp his uncle had given him, and a short dresser that held a yellow porcelain lamp with a grey striped shade, was placed where it always was. Even though he'd probably get in trouble for it, he'd left a few toys scattered around the floor of his room. A blue telephone with large googly eyes and red wheels sat contentedly next to a green plastic fish near the chest of drawers. A few feet from the rolling phone, a purple robot was hanging out in front of the dresser. Gotta say, of all of the things I thought this thing was, I never would have guessed it was a fish. He clenched the white fabric of his quilt and looked at the hand-sewn triangles that were patchworked together with the white material. The triangles had many patterns, some looked like circles and some were leaf or flower shaped. All the patterns shared the same colours of blue, beige and yellow. So, same furniture, same toys, it even stops to mention a lava lamp that I never even knew existed until just now. But there's a pretty important detail that I forgot to mention. The house is also inhabited by a nightmarish chicken, a blue purple bunny, nice colour description there Scott, a metallic fox in the closet, and a bear under the bed. It's not just the exact FNAF 4 house, it also holds the nightmare animatronics. It's almost like Scott aims to tell us something about FNAF 4 in this story. So Rory has supposed nightmares about, well, 
the nightmares. And when it becomes daytime, it's time to go to school. There's just one little problem. He's got absolutely no idea where the front door of the house is. That's right, the kid has tons of memories in this house, and as previously mentioned, he even remembers that he got his lava lamp from his uncle. He knows he needs to go to school just like any other day, but the front door is nowhere to be found in his memory or in his home. And it was at this point in the story I was completely hooked. It has all of the themes we talked about before. There's something wrong with his house. He's being deceived or maybe it's all an illusion. He's being tortured by his nightmares every night and waking up in absolute agony. And there's an overwhelming feeling of isolation as he's left all alone with his mother, supposedly always in the shower not responding to him. This is the definition of dread and it is difficult to read because you know that not everything is as it seems. For one, there seems to be this constant hissing sound coming from the vents, and he also realises that none of the doors in his house actually go into any other room. When I was reading this, I was getting vibes very similar to that of the story Help Wanted. Remember that Steve is fooled into believing he just woke up one day and was suddenly married with kids. His brain was being tortured by a deafening sound which affected how he perceived the world around him. Turns out, it was all fake. Well, similarly, Rory also discovers the truth and it just straight up tells us everything we need to know about FNAF 4. He wakes up one day realising he didn't have a nightmare that night. He looked at his body and he looked like he had been asleep for a decade. He had doubled in size, had a much deeper voice and hair covered his body. As he looked around his room he discovered the reality of the situation. His bedroom was dirty and dusty, wallpaper peeling off the walls. There was a speaker above the bathroom door playing shower audio. The closed off doors had no hinges, but when he looked at the floor, he understood. The hallway floor was weird too, it wasn't the wood floor he remembered. Part of the floor was like that floor, but running down the middle of it was a set of metal tracks embedded in the wood like streetcar tracks. These led all the way back to his bed from a small room. Looking back at him from the shadows of a small dusty enclosure, the decrepit purple blue bunny that was a major player in Rory's ongoing nightmares gazed dark eyed and still straight ahead. Rory's nightmare creature was nothing more than a spooky life-sized figurine. So just so we're all on the same page here, the nightmare animatronics are technically real animatronics. However, the form in which we see them isn't their actual physical form. They are simply mannequins that travel along a track in the floor. So what's creating this illusion? When Rory finds an escape, he comes across a concrete corridor lined with racks of gas masks. There were tanks that warned of compressed gas and pipes that led straight into the bedroom. Here's a quote from the book. According to the papers on the clipboard, the gas in the gas tanks was hallucinogens. These were drugs that made him think he was seeing and doing things he wasn't seeing and doing. The gas was what made him think he was living in the house with his parents. The gas made him think he had to go to school. The gas made him think he was eating real food when in fact the whole time he was eating the awful wafers. The gas was also the sources of his night terrors. He quickly comes to learn that all of it was an experiment on him and that the last test results recorded were 10 years ago when he was just 7 years old. Then, and here's probably the coolest reveal in the story in my opinion, he comes across a room with slanted glass walls and unlit coloured lights above. One blue, one green, one pink and one yellow. On an adjacent glass wall, a poster of a wild looking girl with red pigtails had the word celebrate printed across the top. Yes my friends, we are in the circus gallery right now. And not only that, he finds Ballora herself, gets into the breaker room, finds the Funtime Auditorium and the primary control module with quote, a big currently non-functioning fan on the end wall between glass walls, weird clown faces on the wall near the fan, and the puppet masks on stands atop two cabinets of metal drawers under the fan. What he also finds is the elevator out, but there's no power. And I don't want to drag this on much longer, but this ending to the end of Tales from the Pizzaplex is everything I ever wanted. He hears a man's voice, possibly his father's age, telling him not to mess with the generator. Apparently Rory never fit in at school and he ran away. His father was never home and his mother was dismissive. But he came here because this, this was a more comfortable place. A place where he was never an outcast. And as beautifully read by Matthew Curtis himself at the top of the video, this was his home, where he's safe, secure, and never alone. And just like that, Rory turned back, fixed the gas pumps, and went back to bed. 
In the ceiling above the pump, behind a metal grate, a tape recorder clicked. It then whirred loudly, the sound of a cassette rewinding. Another click. The cassette was once again ready for the next time Rory wandered too far. I cannot seriously stress how much I love this story. It is so tragic, but so beautiful. And of course, there's a whole lot to talk about. I'd go as far as saying this one story actually solves a lot of the FNAF lore spanning over content from not only FNAF 4, but also Sister Location, Pizzeria Simulator, and even Ultimate Custom Night. And on top of all of that, it also adds context to William's motivation and Michael's character. So, let's stop rambling and bake ourselves a theory or something like that. Now, first of all, if you actually take a second and look up what dittophobia is, it's the fear of repetition. And that's such a funny but fitting name for this story because it has two contextual meanings. At first, you may think it refers to Rory's never-ending torture from the nightmare animatronics, but that's not the full picture. Not only has Rory been suffering in this room for 10 entire years and ongoing, but he has supposedly had countless opportunities to make an escape, and every single time it's had the same outcome because of how bad life was on the surface. The ending line of the story implies that it's all one big loop, and that no matter how many times he will be seconds away from leaving, he will always return to his bedroom. The cassette tape will be reset, and the whole system will run again. If there's one thing I did learn from all of this, it's that Afton is even more evil than I initially thought. Okay, sure, he killed many kids, made murderous robots, and built an awful company that would outlive him and indirectly take the lives of so many more, but just seeing this story unfold really opened my eyes and made me realize just how vile this is. So before I mentioned how I thought the reveal of the sister location location was perhaps the coolest reveal in this story, and I actually mean that. Remember that if you look at the map in the breaker room, a lot of things are revealed. Not only was it revealed early on that there was a private room for a secret ending, but there are also these connected rooms that we never see in sister location. And people quickly recognized that these correlated with all of the rooms in FNAF 4. Help Wanted capitalized on this idea, and that's why we see Circus Baby, Bon Bon, Mini Renas, and more sister location animatronics in the FNAF 4 house. So while there's probably another kid being tested on in the plush trap hallway, we know that Rory was in this location. That means he took this secret door through into the private room area. And if you look at the cameras, yep, those are definitely gas canisters. Quite a big supply of them too. And then in the story, Rory comes across a small grey desk with a fan similar to the one in his room. It checks out. And while we're here, allow me to remind you that these monitors show images from these experiment rooms. Moving on, remember that Rory only has one way out of here while I read this quote. Rory pointed his light through a narrow doorway just beyond the metal desk. That was his only option now, so he stepped through it and found himself in another corridor. Although this one wasn't lined with gas tanks or rubber hoses, it still had snakes running all over the walls. These snakes were made out of metal and they looked like electrical lines or maybe water pipes. Rory really couldn't tell. This corridor was dirtier than the last one. The corridor's pale grey walls were covered with streaks of grease and the lines and pipes had woolly layers of dust. It smelled like a mechanic's shop. So I'm not certain of this and maybe it'll be more clear when we get the full book. But the way I see it is he goes out into the Funtime Auditorium and then goes right in the primary control module to find himself at the Circus Gallery. It's possible there are other ways to get in there, but to me it all matches. And even if there are inconsistencies, this is basically a one-to-one -to, -one to sister location, which is absolutely nuts. Now notice that Ballora still exists, and so does Funtime Foxy, which signifies to me that this takes place before Sister Location. If we go out on a limb and say that these experiments can't begin until after the Bite of 83, that puts Sister Location after 1993 at least, meaning it would solve the whole debate on whether it comes before or after FNAF 1. I'll leave you to decide on that one though. Now sure, I am here to say that I think most of FNAF is now solved because of this story, but there is one part I actually think I need some help on. That's this other set of rooms on the map that I skipped over before. Here we have the bedroom, here's the plush trap hallway, and this... Well, this looks to be the minigame map. So, my question, because I actually have zero idea how this could work, is what could this experiment be? Was the crying child's life all one big lie, just like Rory's? If so, then that would mean the bite of 83 wouldn't be real. 
It's a confusing one, and that's why I need your explanations in the comments below. Speaking of the houses, it now makes perfect sense as to why every house we see looks so different. There were three different houses we thought Afton could have had all at once. The FNAF 4 Gameplay House, the FNAF 4 Minigame House, and the Midnight Motorist House. We now know that the Gameplay House was definitely fake, and we aren't entirely sure that Orange Guy is even Afton in the first place. After all, the Ultimate Guide says it might not be. More on that in a second. So I think that Afton's true house is the FNAF 4 minigame house. Though the absence of Afton's room, or even Michael's room for that matter, could be a clue that this minigame is in fact just within the facility. Just remember that this minigame is connected to the Fredbear plush after all, which we do see everywhere in that map. Okay, perhaps the moment you've been waiting for. One of the minigames notorious for being so goddamn confusing, Midnight Motorist. I want to stress that this story makes a lot of things explicit and extremely clear. Rory used to live a life that he was unhappy with. His father was almost never home and he didn't feel very comfortable around his mother. It sounds to me like that's not it though. It sounds to me, with underlying themes from this story, that he was abused. Probably from alcoholic parents, meaning he never felt safe at home and he never felt safe at school. But there was one place where he did feel safe and that's where he always ran off to. I really hope you can see the connections here. Okay, I'll admit it, for sure. There are gaps in our knowledge, and there are still going to be things that are unexplained. But my proposition is that Orange Guy isn't William Afton at all. It's the father of one of his victims. The child broke out one final time and went back with William Afton in his Spring Bonnie costume. And from there, he felt safe and secure. I've heard a lot of explanations for Midnight Motorist, but to me this is by far the most satisfying one. Not only does it connect to this super relevant story, but it just completely makes sense. It never made any sense for William to suddenly be an orange yellow guy in the first place, literally the opposite colour to purple. If this was William, I have a lot of questions about the house, the lack of family members, who would have kidnapped the child, and just the whole significance of the minigame in the first place. I know that a lot of you won't be convinced by this, and that is fine, but at this current time I see this option as the strongest one that we have yet. Okay, so I still have a few more things to discuss before we wrap all this up. You're welcome for the extra long video by the way. Let's go back to basics, and talk about FNAF 4. That's a sentence I didn't think I'd ever say. In Ultimate Custom Night, Nightmare Fredbear said, This time, there is more than an illusion to fear. And he was being very literal. Nightmare Freddy said, I am remade, but not by you, by the one you should not have killed. Makes sense knowing that Afton made the nightmares. Here's the thing though, did he make Nightmare Fredbear or not? Did he make Nightmare? Because it's definitely something we see in FNAF 4, but not something we see in Dittophobia. Well, to answer this, I think we need to answer who we play as in FNAF 4. I think the answer is pretty obvious. We just have to play as Michael Afton. Reason being, he draws Nightmare Fredbear in his survival logbook. But notice something else here. He's responding to the question, do you have dreams? That's interesting because I thought he just clarified that this is all a physical illusion. Well, to that, I have to say that just because we're playing in the FNAF 4 bedroom doesn't mean it happens inside the facility. Remember that FNAF 4 is riddled with easter eggs. Flowers, IV drips, medication, and of course, the FNAF 1 phone call. It seems to me that in FNAF 4, we play as Michael, who is experiencing someone else's memories of being in this testing facility in the form of nightmares. Ugh. But here's a food for thought. What if it's the memories of the crying child? What if FNAF 4 is just Michael's form of an ultimate custom nightmare conducted by the crying child himself. If that's the case, then it would have to mean that the crying child was originally tested on, which makes his story even more tragic. But I want to hear what you think. Here's what I think, Dittophobia is a masterpiece, and it was exactly the ending we needed for Tales from the Pizzaplex. I now have a huge boost of theorist motivation, and I actually think we could get a lot of FNAF solved from this, so I look forward to reading your comments and perhaps even reviewing your theories in an upcoming video. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.